the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be always pleasing to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So the, uh, the par- pro- parable of the prodigal son is a well-known, uh, it's a well-known parable. It's one that we've all heard. We've all heard people tell us what it means. And so that just means that we have to work a little bit harder to find today's message in it. But fortunately, I have found a commentary that truly speaks at my level. This is a children's book written by Amy Jill Levine and Sandy Eisenberg Sasso. Amy Jill Levine is a Jewish New Testament scholar, which is kind of an interesting thing, right? Um, And it really is a, a wonderful book. And it has three parables in it. It has the parable of the 100 sheep, right? If you had 100 sheep and one of them was lost, you would leave the 99 and go and find the one that was lost. And when you found it, you would rejoice. And the parable of the 10 coins, what, what woman, when she had 10 coins and lost one, wouldn't sweep the whole house looking under all the furniture until she found that 10th coin. And then she would celebrate and rejoice. And then the two sons, the story of the two sons. And In all of these stories, the point, every single one of them ends with the same phrase. Um, And it's, it's really, it's beautiful and it's important. Without you, he said, something is missing. With you, our family is complete. Without that tenth coin, something was missing. With it, we are complete. Without that hundredth sheep, something was missing. With it. We are complete. And the reason that this is important is because we are made for relationship. We are made for connection. That's what God wants for us. That's what God uh, desires for us. When we are whole and complete and fulfilling all that God hopes for us, we are in loving relationship with God and with one another. So I want to look at this parable, and I want to look at it from, the perspective, from that perspective, right? What is it in this parable, what, how can we learn about separation and how we might come back together again? How do we cross that great divide that we've been talking about these last several weeks, those divisions that happen in families and they happen in communities, and they happen in, in countries, and they happen between countries, and they lead to such horrors as the war in Ukraine right now, and the famine in South Sudan, and Yemen, and uh, the other places in, through the Central Africa there that are experiencing a famine now worse than anything they've seen since 1981. What is it that, that allows us to separate ourselves from one another in these ways. And, and, and what does Christ teach us that might help us bridge those connections, come back together? So I was uh, looking at various commentaries on the prodigal son, and I found a wonderful one this, this week. Um, this one, it's, it's current. It was just written, um, and it was written by uh, a priest named Naveen, Saras. And Naveen is a Palestinian Christian born and raised in Bethlehem, in Palestine. So that's where she grew up. And she's now a Lutheran pastor, and I want to say Wisconsin, but I'm not re- remembering exactly where she's currently serving, but it's, it's one of those flyover states, you know. Um, So um, what she does is she talks about, she analyzes and describes the the story of the prodigal son uh, from the perspective of a shame-honor society. And she makes the argument that um, the the Palestinian, modern-day Palestinian culture is a shame-honor structured or based society. So shame and honor are very, very central to their self-identity and to the way they function. And then she goes on to argue that this same 
shame on society or structure was present in first century Palestine as of Jesus and those listening to this parable. And she goes through the parable and points out all the places where shame and honor are important. And it starts with that very first episode where the younger son comes to his father and says, give me my inheritance now. N.T. Wright uh, uh, writes about this in his book, Luke for Everyone, which is an excellent book if you ever want to read a, a book about Luke's gospel. And he says that it's as if the son came to his father and said, I wish you were dead. I don't want you. I don't want my family. I don't want my relationship with you. Just give me the money. Give it to me now. Well, there wasn't money. It was property. It was land. It was ancestral land. But he, and so it was deeply offensive and deeply shameful, dishonoring for him to ask for that, and he does. Now, Naveen uh, Saras says that what would have happened in her culture, in her growing up, if, if someone came to their family with a request like this, it would have, they would have been uh, punished. They would have been shunned. That was a shameful thing for them to do. They would have been, she says there, there have even been stories of members of families that have been cast out and are no longer considered a member of the family over an offense like this. That's how the shame honor society, the shame honor system works. But the father doesn't do that, does he? The father gives him his portion of the inheritance which the son promptly, apparently, sells, and then taking the money from the sale goes off to a foreign land. Now think about that, from, again, from the shame perspective. He sells it. Everybody in town is going to know that the younger son of this father has just sold part of the family land and is taken off for parts unknown. Again, a deeply shameful thing. So he goes off to a foreign country, and things go just about as you would expect, and he uh, uh, eventually runs out of money. You know, he's the younger son, right? He didn't get half. He got whatever the younger son would have gotten from the inheritance, and so it runs out, and there's a famine in that land, and he finds himself hungry, and he gets a job. He hires himself out to feed someone's pigs. So that tells you he's now working for a Gentile. And not only is he working for a Gentile, he's feeding the Gentile pigs. Shame upon shame for a Jewish man. All right? So the shame continues in this story. So eventually, he comes to himself, it says. He realizes how far he has fallen, how much he has lost, right? He's lost so much social standing. He's, he's, he, he, he's probably wondering how he can even show his face back home and in town because he has failed so terribly. And he decides that the only thing he can do is humble himself and repent for all that he has done. And he goes back, he plans his speech, and he goes back to his father. While he was still far off, his father saw him. And he ran out to where he was. He ran to him. He ran and embraced him. The father was filled with compassion for this lost son who had now come home. There we have another episode that would have deep significance in a shame-honor society. Because in a shame-honor society, elders do not run. They just don't do it. For one thing, the clothes that they wore, that men didn't wear slacks, they wore robes. And so to run, he would have had to pull up his robes, bearing his knees, and, and run, right? So Naveen Savas, Savas or, I'm sorry, I'm getting her name wrong, Naveen Saras says that in all of her life, 
she never saw her now, her, her, now her late father, he's dead now, but she never saw him run. And she certainly never saw her grandfather run or her mother run. Elders just don't do that. And so he shamed himself. He embarrassed everyone by running, okay? So the shame theme continues through this story. Um, and then the prodigal love, right? Do you know what prodigal means? We all just assume it means the bad guy, right? Because it's the prodigal son. But prodigal means uh, uh, just like ridiculously too much, right? To over and over abundance, a, 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 you know, doing something that is just stupid or silly, right? So the prodigal son wastes all of his inheritance. And, and Naveen calls the father the prodigal father because his love is so overabundant so generous that it's it's kind of ridiculous how much love he shows to this son in this episode running to see, expressing his joy openly for everyone to see running and embracing the son and then what does he do he tells his slave to bring a beautiful robe to cover the filth and shame, the nakedness of the returning son. And now he will be clothed. And to bring a ring, a signet ring, a family ring, to signify, to indicate that he has returned to his place in the family. And, and this last one is interesting because I, I had no idea before reading Naveen's commentary. She says, and the sandals. Bring him sandals for his feet. Now, in Palestinian culture, especially first century Palestinian uh, culture, people would, uh, guests would remove their shoes as they came into a house, but the master would wear shoes. And so for him to put shoes on his son is to elevate his status above that of all the other guests. So again, this shame honor society gives us all of these insights into the significance of the story. And then the final shame, the final shame comes when the elder son refuses to come in. He's furious. He's furious that the father is spending even more of their money, right? This, this killing the fatted calf. That's enough to, kill, to feed a hundred people, right? This fatted calf is probably a year old uh, cow, and they're having this amazing feast. You know, this is the kind of feast that you only have on the highest feast days. And here they are feasting with this son, and he, and so the, the, the elder son, the angry one, said, uh, repeats, emphasizes, amplifies all of the shames of the son, of the younger son, right? He says, he's wasted your money. He's, he, not only did he waste it, he spent it on prostitutes. And now you're going to kill the fatted calf for him? What about me? Shame is the driving force separating this family, separating the sons from their father, separating the, the, the prodigal son from his whole community, separating potentially the father with his... Uh, overt displays of, of compassion and love from his own honor. And shame exists in our society as well. It is a driving force in our society. I'm doing a program right now with uh, four other men, including our bishop, and he's, he's leading it. On It's called Feminism for Men. And we've been looking at how the patriarchy and how the, be, the expectations and behavior of men are enforced and taught through shame. Which is, a, that's a really, it's an uncomfortable thing to, to look at, I have to say. It's very uncomfortable. Um, shame separates families. It separates communities. It separates countries. And shame thrives on Secrecy, silence, and judgment. Secrecy, silence, and judgment allow someone to stew in their shame, to, to know, oh, you really are, you really are shamed, right? But, but here's the thing. Shame can't survive in the presence of empathy. Empathy is enough to end shame. 
Shame is the fear of disconnection, of cut off, of being cut off from your family, of being shunned. Is there something about me that if people see, if they see it, I won't be worthy of connection, participation, or belonging? That's the root of shame, right? Note the two turning points of this story of the prodigal son. The son comes to himself, he realizes he has failed, and determines to risk going back, to risk facing his own shame. In the community, with his family, with his father, he, he's willing to be vulnerable. And the father sees the son coming and is filled with compassion. Those are the turning points. To find our way back to each other, to bridge these great divides that separate countries like Russia and the Ukraine from each other, that separate uh, us politically between conservatives and liberals, that separate us over issues of race and religion and gender and sexual preference and all of the things that we allow to divide ourselves where shame is used to keep people in line. To find our way back to each other, we have to look at those two turning points. And those two turning points were the vulnerability of the son and the compassion of the father. Compassion and vulnerability are the ways Jesus shows us to find our way back to each other. Vulnerability is the core of shame and fear and at the core of our struggle for worthiness. But vulnerability is also the birthplace of joy, of creativity, of belonging and love. Vulnerability is emotional risk, exposure, and uncertainty. It takes courage to be vulnerable and to be compassionate as the Father was. Vulnerability and compassion are not weakness. Our shame honor system tells us that if you are vulnerable, you are weak. And in, in, for men today, the worst thing we can be is to be seen as weak. That's not okay. And so vulnerability is portrayed as weakness, but it's not. In fact, vulnerability is probably the greatest measure of courage. So Jesus leaves us with the elder son standing outside, not coming in, and we wonder, will he have the compassion to forgive his brother? Will he have the courage to be vulnerable with his father and enter the party? And we have the prodigal love of the Father, obviously of God. And it models and invites our own compassion and vulnerability.